The Earth from space is an absolute amazing sight to behold. No matter how much you've been told about what it will look like, you cannot expect what you will actually see because the sun shines off of it so brightly and it's so beautiful and so vibrant that it just takes your breath away the first time you see it. The first time I saw it, I hadn't even gotten to the International Space Station yet. I was in a Soyuz spacecraft, really small, three people squeezed in there and we were on our way to the International Space Station, which takes about six hours. And I opened the little cover of my window, a little porthole next to my head. And the second I saw the Earth, I exclaimed out loud, oh my gosh. And my crewmates, Nick and Alexi, were, were wondering what happened. And um, so it, I learned a lesson right away, don't say oh my gosh, uh, with expression in a spacecraft when you're autonomously flying through the blackness of space but they immediately understood that it was the view of the Earth that had taken my breath away. And it is really phenomenal. And um, like I said, it's crystal clear, bright as you can imagine, and just the vibrant blues shining off the cloud formations, the, the land masses, and you just see it all against the backdrop of the universe. And it's truly a sight to behold. I wish that every human could see it from that perspective. The fragility of the Earth definitely resonates. And you know, Mike Collins saw it from even farther away, from about a thousand times farther away than I did, where it was just a blue marble, like he's described it. And you know, these famous Earthrise photos that were taken from the moon of the entire Earth in one frame, it just really allowed us to see our planet for what it was. And that's a wonderful thing. From the perspective 250 miles up and not 250,000 miles away from the moon, what you're able to see is the thin blue line of our atmosphere that's not far above the surface of the Earth. And you see how you know precious and precarious that line is against the universe and recognizing that that holds in the atmosphere that sustains us all. And that you know that's a really special thing and that it's not that big compared to the size of the planet. So it's something that we definitely can have an effect on as humans and have to keep in mind as we decide how we want to live. Our schedule there is extremely regimented. We work for about 12 hours a day and our schedule is timed down to the five minute increment. So literally at the start of any week, I could tell you exactly what I was going to be doing to the five minute increment four days later and it was all laid out. And so our job was just to execute that plan very efficiently. And, you know, that kind of constant sense of productivity and of being able to, to do what you're asked to do and to give back and do science all the time really helped to sort of sustain the long haul up there. We're really in a place where we do still depend on regular cargo shipments of almost everything we need. That includes food primarily, and all our food is dehydrated, so you know it's able to be brought up in the most efficient way possible. But we are moving towards autonomy, and some of the ways you see that is in our water recycling. We do recycle almost 90% of all of our water, so that includes our own urine. So we like to say that yesterday's coffee is also tomorrow's coffee. And then we do some 3D printing and things like that to be more autonomous in terms of being able to um, fix things or build mechanical parts. But there is a special connection knowing when you look down on Earth that the things that you're seeing are also sustaining you, even though you aren't necessarily under that thin blue line of the atmosphere. And to me, that just spoke to human ingenuity and us working hard together to achieve difficult things. We were not necessarily meant to live outside that thin blue line, but we came together and recognized the benefits that we can bring back to Earth in doing that together and taking on the teamwork that's required to get us there and to create a habitable environment up there and to make sure that the same things that the atmosphere naturally provides us when we take care of it, that we've recreated those things in the space station. And it was a very wonderful way to acknowledge that relationship in looking down on the earth and you see that chain of life from the pollinators to um, my dehydrated stir fry. It's, it really, it can extend that far. If I were honored to be one of the first people to go back to the moon in the Artemis program, it would be just that, an incredible honor. And that's how I would look at it, not necessarily uh, as my moment <laughs> to say the perfect thing, but 
I do think that with that honor comes a responsibility to try to capture the human part of why it's so important that we've come together to do that. And so that reflection comes naturally to me because I'm constantly evaluating why I want to become an astronaut and why I've dedicated my life to this particular endeavor. And I see that as being important because NASA is really answering humanity's call to explore. And we're doing it right now at a time when we understand how important it is to go by all and for all. And we understand that that's important because not only of the success of the mission that you get when you take inputs from, from every single person that wants to contribute, but also because it's important that we represent every part of humanity in what we're doing and that we make sure that everyone's questions are represented when we go to the moon to answer that call to explore. One thing that I was able to do at NC State is have that interdisciplinary aspect to my education. I studied abroad in Ghana, so I, when I was in Ghana, I took drumming, I took a Twi language, which is a local language, and I was also able at NC State to do rock climbing. And along with double majoring in physics and electrical engineering, doing recreation, I was in the sailing club and a lot of different um, sort of like human rights clubs and, and volunteering, things like that. And I think that interestingly, when I went to apply to an astronaut and I had my interviews on site, we talked so much more about studying abroad and about rock climbing than we ever talked about engineering or physics. And I think that that really goes to show that in order to truly kind of be productive, you do have to have to see a lot of different things and take in a lot of different perspectives. And that's truly what allows us to when we are focusing on our specialty to be most successful in making the prolific things that we're going to do in that because without that deeper understanding um, it's really about making sure that the specialties we have can kind of be put out into the world and do their best and in, in affecting the world in the po most positive way and that really takes an understanding that's broader than just those specialties. I stayed very busy. I was interested in so many different things and so I just soaked up the different offerings of clubs, outings, and things like that, volunteer opportunities like a sponge. And in some ways, I, if I were to do it again, I might do, do a little bit less broad and, and take a little more time in each because I, I think being oversubscribed can also uh, kind of take away from the quality of what you're doing. But yeah, I was just ready to take on everything. I knew that I wanted to be an astronaut, but I also knew that if I became one, I didn't want it to be because I had lived my life according to a checklist of what you had to do to be an astronaut. So I was really interested in if I got there, going there through a path that I forged on my own by following my passions and what I thought would give the most back to the world. And so that's why you see things like rock climbing and studying abroad in Ghana as opposed to becoming a private pilot or, or some other things that are kind of on that checklist. And then also um, humanitarian things were really important to me. I was a part of Engineers Without Borders. I was a part of BGLA. I was a part of things that really looked towards making sure that inclusion was on the forefront. I was involved in the technician. I took pictures for the technician. I wrote op-eds into the technician about diversity and inclusion. So I was really just kind of on all fronts, just pushing the boundary, um, maybe to a fault, but I enjoyed it. I really loved staying busy. I tried to make sure that even though I was pretty involved in academics, I had strong social connections and family connections. And um, I remember my first year, I saved up all year so that I could travel abroad on my own over the summer. It was more about doing the things that I loved. And then down the road, if I looked back upon the experiences and skills that I gained, if I could make the case that I would actually be a good astronaut and be able to contribute to human spaceflight, this, you know, something I held in such a high regard, only then would I actually apply. And so my goal was to follow my passions and um, hopefully become the best person I could be so that, so that one day if I did make that evaluation, I would be likely to see those skills had developed. And in terms of doubts, I think I was too caught up in just enjoying everything I did and going after so many things to necessarily wonder um, if it was the right path. I just did things that I loved. And of course, there were lots of doubts along the way, you know, of the ups and downs of any college career. But I was, I was pretty unconventional in my thinking and my approach to things. And I think that my advisors and the people around me just sort of let me run with that.
I was really fortunate throughout my life to have people that encouraged me. Even in my small town of Jacksonville, North Carolina, no one told me I was a crazy little girl because I wanted to be an astronaut. I think I found my first inspirations in my hometown in Jacksonville, North Carolina. I loved anything that made me feel small and pondered my place in the wider universe. I loved looking up at the night sky. I loved going out on the ocean. And we had travel magazines growing up around my house. So I would just look at all these really far flung places. And one, I loved space exploration. And then also I loved the idea of going to Antarctica. And so in my room, like as a fifth grader, I had pictures of the shuttle and space up, but I also had maps of Antarctica on the wall. And I think just that in innate desire to explore was really what drove me. And I think in terms of the non-conventional aspects, it's just where I found myself. Like for example, I was a cheerleader that had to take off from cheerleading camp to go get an academic award at Duke University in middle school. And so I just always found myself in that place and I was comfortable being a little bit different, um, but, but relentlessly pursuing the things that I loved. For as long as I'm sticking with NASA, part of what we sign on for is to complete the mission that we believe in um, and that we trust NASA with. I and mean, right now that's the Artemis mission and going back to the moon and then eventually to Mars. So that's something I couldn't agree with more wholeheartedly. So it's a really exciting time to be a part of NASA. Um, right now, I'm fortunate that I feel like every day I'm working in a way that gives back to the world. So I, I'm able to, to fulfill that aspect of myself in my day-to-day -day job. I think the big takeaway for me was seeing that there is such a thing as a global scale. You cannot actually see that when you're on Earth. You can be told about it, but you don't actually physically see it with your own eyes. And to see the fact that the Earth really is its own encapsulated unit in the universe, and that if things can be provided on a global scale, such as the air we breathe, the food that we have, the climate that produces all of that and the delicate ecosystem. If they can be provided on a global scale, they can also not be provided on a global scale because of some root cause that could cause that to happen. And so just recognizing that that scale does exist and that we do have an effect on it. When we were flying over most landforms on the planet, you would see evidence of humans in those places. And we have had an effect on our planet. You know, we're used to this complex ecosystem, a complex economic system and political system that we've created that provides us, especially in America, with pretty much everything we need to survive. But there's no engine out there guaranteeing that. We have to continue to guarantee that by our choices and how we live our lives. And recognizing that I think was the most important thing. In my work with NOAA before I became an astronaut, I worked in really remote climate stations all over the world to measure kind of like the baseline of what the atmosphere was doing and especially how much CO2 and other different things were in the atmosphere and a very, very baseline, not necessarily directly affected by a city nearby. And also when I was in that job at NOAA, I learned about how we came together globally several decades ago to solve the global scale problem of the ozone hole. And when this problem was first identified by scientists and the solution to it was first identified, people were up in arms. It seemed like it was insurmountable. It wasn't something that we wanted to do to have to limit the ozone gases that were causing the hole. But we ultimately decided that it had to happen we took the hard steps to make it happen and we actually solved that global scale problem. And so I look back to that as an example that we can come together even when we're not used to the things that we might have to do to solve the problem. Once we've taken that difficult step to recognize the problem and what we have to do to solve it and that it's important enough to make those changes, we can look back on something and we'll be decades on the other side of it and think about how glad we were that we worked together and came together to solve that problem. So the global scale and the fact that we can affect it and that actually we have to was the biggest perspective I got looking down on Earth. <laughs>